Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation for the AppSec Village at uh, DEF CON 29. Uh, it's both uh, uh, an honor and uh, uh, a very uh, nice thing for both of us to be able to be here talking to you guys about this. Uh, we are Matt, and I am Izar. Something about us, and why are we talking about this stuff here? Uh, I'm a security principal security engineer at Squarespace, the security thing for a long time, mostly on the defense side, on the builder side. And I am currently focusing on uh, modern SDLCs and how we get security into them and how we get developers to actually do security. And I'm Matt Coles. I'm a uh, security engineer over at, at Dell Technologies. And I work on protecting physical devices primarily and the ecosystems, making them secure for the products that we sell and the ways that we build them. We have been collaborating since 2010 when we both worked at uh, what was at the time the uh, the product security office at Dell. Uh, sorry, at the time it was EMC, then it became Dell EMC. We have uh, recently co-authored an O'Reilly book called Threat Modeling, a Practical Guide for Development Teams, or as uh, we internally call it, the Ugly Fish book. And we are proud members of the 15 uh, experts that came together last year to write the Threat Modeling Manifesto, which actually we are going to be citing throughout this presentation. Now, the standard disclaimer is in there. We are speaking for ourselves. We are not speaking for our uh, respective employers. And uh, let's take it on the road. So what do we have for you today? We are going to talk mostly about the modeling part of threat modeling. We, in our experience uh, working with developers in doing threat models, we have seen that uh, many times they are not exactly very um, happy to be asked to do diagrams. In some cases, hey, they have been what can even be called refractory to the uh, idea of sitting down and doing a, a, a model. We are going to talk a bit about the many ways that you can model a system. Uh, we are going to discuss briefly the role of actually diagramming, creating diagrams in system modeling. And then we are going to ask ourselves, what can we do differently? What can mitigate those small problems that we have with the developer community in uh, doing the, uh, the models for their threat models? And then we're going to show what we think is a very developer-friendly uh, distributed way to actually create a model and take things a bit farther. So the big question here is, why is this important? Why do we even need to model our systems? Developers know what they're writing, right? They know what they're building. Hmm. Yeah, sure, they do. So basically, a threat model is a function of whatever representation of the system we put together, and then the second part, which is the threat elicitation. Now, we as security uh, experts, we're very good at the second part. We're very good at the threat el elicitation. We know how to figure out what could possibly go wrong. Where we and the developers many times are a bit not so good is on the system representation, which you could say is the set of all the elements in the system, plus the way that they interact with each other, plus the attributes that they have. And we're going to talk a bit, uh, a bit more about what these attributes are later in the, the talk. Now, who is this person that can create models? Uh, how can we create a representation that is more clear and more representative than the sum of their parts? How can we codify the way that they talk to each other in a way that somebody can look at it and be able to infer security value from what's represented in there. So developers, engineers, they, they many times they see very different angles from an architect or from people from QA or anybody else that works with that system. So when you give developers the task, the engineers, the, the task to, uh, to represent that, that model, many times what come out of it is what we call Eureka moments. 
you have the, the room and everybody's discussing the model and the big architect is saying, hey, the, th the way that we do this is part A talks to part B and then they both get whatever was, uh, was uh, processed in there and they dump it into part C. And then you have the junior developer there in the end of the, the room slowly raises their hand and says, hey, you know what? Yeah, that's the way that it was designed. But unfortunately, because of the constraints of the framework that we use, because of the language, because of the deployment, we had to slightly change things. And now you have this part D between B and C that actually translates things. And that's when people start noticing that the system actually as it exists is not exactly what they had in their minds. Now, many times you have to get into that uh, explain like I'm five thing, meaning, you know, if, if you can't model your system, then let's be very honest, you, you have bigger problems than threat modeling. If you can't construct a representation of whatever it is that you are building in your mind and be able to translate it into a way that you can explain to somebody else, which is basically creating a model, you have bigger problems. And it's time to step back from threat modeling and reconsider the whole enterprise. And yeah, to tell you the truth, uh, it's good documentation. It's useful later on, not only for threat modeling, but for other things as well. So it's an after effect, but actually it proves to be a very uh, uh, valuable one. Now, why is it that developers come and say that they don't like to, to model their systems? Sometimes they say it, sometimes they actually do, but mostly they just, just say it. So. First of all, they, many times they, they don't even know that they already know how to do it. I mean, how many times completely detached from threat modeling have you seen a team get together in a room and start discussing what is it that they're building and somebody immediately jumps up and starts drawing circles and arrows on the whiteboard and then somebody gets another color and starts erasing the first arrows and putting arrows to different uh, blobs and whatnot. They don't know that they already know how to do it, but when you put it in the framework of, hey, this is part of threat modeling, we'll see later. Things can get a bit scary. People become a bit reluctant of what's going to happen. Again, it is considered a documentation effort, and sometimes developers say, you know what? It was hard to write, it should be hard to read, so we're not going to, to document it more than it should. Then we have the phenomenon of passing the ball. Passing the ball, how? Hey, you know what? The guy that actually knows the system enough to create a model of it, he just happens to not be around this week. So yeah, no. Or, hey, you're the security guy. Can't you do it yourself? They forget that as security people, we are probably never going to understand the system as well as the people who actually wrote it. They also so, seem to forget, as our, sorry to interrupt, uh, no, no, that you know this is not something that a security person should be doing on in a vacuum. Right. This is a team sport by design. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, exactly. I'll use that phrase. Uh, and and you know, so passing the ball here, they want to keep themselves out of the loop because it's hard or it's work, and not necessarily and and try to get others to do their work for them. But it, it's more than that, right? So, you know, keep in mind that this is a collaborative effort and should be a collaborative effort. Yeah. And then we have, you know, that, that part that is really, really, really not nice to reach, but unfortunately sometimes happens, which is winding it away. Oh, you're going to drop our velocity because you're stopping us from actually writing lines of code to draw a model. Oh, it's not going to work. It's not going to add anything to the effort. So there is that little myopia is not, not being able to see that that small effort in the beginning actually is going to, to, to bear fruit later on and bring advantages to the understanding of the whole system. People actually get out of a modeling exercise. I'm not even reaching the threat part of it, of a modeling exercise. The team itself, as, as Matt said, it's a team sport. They come out with a better understanding of what is it that they are building. So however it is that at the end of the day, we express that, that model, people will get a benefit from understanding better what is it that they are doing together. At the end of the day, one of the big things that stops people from that modeling effort is the fact that there isn't an agreed way of uh, doing that, that, that model. There isn't an agreed language. You don't go forward and you say, hey guys, we're going to use blah, blah, blah. 
and we're going to have this amazing model that everybody understands because everybody speaks blah 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 and all of a sudden i feel like i'm in a disney movie <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways yeah so so speaking of agreed upon language even if we agree on a language uh or somebody agrees on a language there it's not necessarily an understandable to everybody right so so why do we why do we rely on diagrams in particular for for modeling right so when, when we do a model we're we're building this representation right and we want to understand what the system looks like but we don't need all the details right and so we so that we, we need to model but we rely on diagrams because well <laughs> Your different different people in your organization will have different understandings of things, but they'll also potentially be, I mean, literally speaking different languages, or won't completely understand the terminology or the context of things. And so, we as engineers, especially and architects, uh, systems designers, uh, and security people, uh, you know, QA, any type of role that you're doing, uh, you tend to be very visual, right? Uh, and so. You could describe a system, and in fact, we're we're big fans of of describing a system verbally. But you can lose that can. There's a lot that can be lost in translation, uh, and so we really want to look at you know, or or as as professionals, as experts, and and not only and, and as developers, we turn to models to to diagrams in particular, to give us a better understanding about a system. With uh, with as minimal translation as possible. So if we look at the language uh, on the left, right, that actually describes this model. But obviously, it's a lot easier to read that <laughs> that model than it is to to read that text, right? Uh, and so, in a nutshell, in a in a few symbols on a page, you can quickly understand what the system is doing. Uh, whereas you know you'd have to go out to Google Translate uh, or something, and 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 hopefully you get back the right information, right? And so it's not perfect, but that's okay, right? We ex you're able to uh, express to your 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 team, especially, and, and and actually that's that's really important. We probably should touch upon that for a sec. Uh, that models need to be valuable and meaningful to the to the people or the or the organizations that are going to be consuming the model and not really anybody else, right? Yeah. Uh, and so if you're a developer, a designer, uh, a QA, a security lead, um, you know, the model has to has to make sense because obviously we're going to take it to the next level and do that threat elicitation. Uh, so it has to have enough information encoded in it. Um, but but beyond that, you, that's really all you need, right? And here we have a model that has small number of, number of elements in them with some basic interactions and some uh, some attributes that we can then leverage. And that gets a point across. And that's the important part here. And I apologize to the, Scot <laughs> to the Scottish people for, for butchering this, I'm sure, using, uh, using automatic translation software. But actually, Matt, there is one more important thing here that the, the mention of Gaelic uh, just reminded me. We work in distributed teams. And many times we have people from many countries working together. And English is the lingua franca of uh, development, but uh, not everybody speaks English at the same level or with the same uh, fluency. And I've, I've seen in the past that somebody who's in that uh, role where they can't, they don't really speak clear English, they were able to point at the diagram and say, it's not like this. So you, you break down barriers of language and sometimes even of culture by giving people another different way of looking at that system and agreeing that that's actually what we are building. Right. Yeah, that's, a really, that's a really good point, Isar. Um, and so there are really a lot of ways you could express a system model. Uh, we've touched upon a couple of them already, but but just to, just to sort of flesh out the list here, in the, in the creative process, a lot of people talk about, you know, drawing a little, you know, something on the back of a paper napkin, and that's the big vision that they have. And by the way, that's perfectly reasonable, right? You can, per, you can, you can reasonably construct a model of a system, a representation of a system on a piece of paper or on the back of a napkin, just as a doodle, 
right? Or in, you know, paint or whatever, like whatever you want. And then, but there's more structured ways of, of doing doing diagramming uh, as, a, as a team and organization gets more mature and, and capable, right? Uh, so back in napkin drawing, perfectly reasonable. I don't think I've seen it too often myself. I don't know. Is there if you've ever ever seen this in a business sense? But uh, I'm sure not I'm sure it big, happens. Not on big models. <laughs> <laughs> it can get kind of confusing. You have to put multiple pieces of napkin together. Uh, so not recommended for big systems, but certainly it could be done. Uh, but it's a concept actually more so than anything else, right? So as opposed to a structured thing where it's you know a big event and a, and, and and you know that documentation on a quick meeting in somebody's office, right? Where you grab that little side whiteboard on your on your cube or uh, you know, grab a piece of paper off the printer and just start drawing drawing something on that to express an idea. Again, that graphical nature comes through and you can use that to express some basic information, which you can then use to do some of that basic threat elicitation that we've we're again we're not going to talk about today, but that's the next step in the process. Now, as you move up the sort of the maturity and the, the um, structured scale, right? You'll have some block diagrams. Now, we talked earlier about how developers, uh, you know, sometimes have a hard time doing modeling because they think it's it's hard or it's different or it's not their job. But in fact, they already do, as Isar has mentioned, because they build block diagrams, right, of an architecture. Right. When you, if you have a software stack or you have a system stack in general, you know, you may have a block diagram that shows the different building blocks and how they sort of sit on each other or next to each other or how they potentially have interactions. And so, you know, somebody should be able to use that to start, at least start the conversation around, around a, a system, an understanding of a system that you can use to do threat modeling. Uh, but it also could be used directly. Right. Um, now, traditional threat modeling uses something called data flow diagrams, uh, or I should say, the most the more common methods of doing, doing threat modeling use data flow diagrams, where we basically describe the elements of a system and their interactions, but specifically how data thro- flows through a system. It ignores architectural information to a grand extent, but really does highlight how data flows throughout the system, and it's usually along data flows where you get security concerns. Right, um, but it, again, and so far we've talked about three ways of doing modeling. They all express similar things. They provide information in a graphical form, usually in a graphical form, to to the attendees or the stakeholders, and they're all valid for purposes of doing a system model. Moving up the scale, might look at something like a sequence diagram. Uh, where now instead of looking at uh, an object and the interaction, how data flows, we may look at those objects interactions in terms of order and time dependence, right? So not only does something, does A talk to B, but does A talk to B and then B talks to C and, and what order do those messages occur? Because that can be very important. Uh, other diagrams as we move up the scale, process diagrams is a good one. So how do not only to have, how do system objects talk to each other, but how do uh, how do maybe systems and processes work, right? So this happens a lot in process engineering, especially for like chemical plants and things like that. But you could use it for really for any type of system analysis. Um, I, and I just realized we left something off this slide, um, which is attack trees, right? Mm-hmm. So we have this notion of of attack trees that are another form of model. It's another another graphical system, but it really connects a. It's sort of a cause and effect diagram, right? And so we look at what does an attacker, what's an attacker's goal, and how are they going to meet get to that goal by what are the things necessary in order to to meet that? And then build, you build out this hierarchy, and it's an attack tree. It's effectively a sequence of attack of attack and defense mechanisms um, when it's fully constructed, and it expresses information in a different way. But still useful for that that threat analysis side of things. Um, the last three on this are a little bit different. So DFD three is DFD version three, uh, being championed by uh, Adam Shostak, uh, who is uh, as anybody who does security for a living probably knows knows of him, uh, and uh, 
and especially threat modeling. Well, specifically threat modeling, uh, and that uh, you know DFT three is is a more simplified version of the traditional data flow uh, diagram. So data flow diagrams have these free esoteric shapes that are hard to draw in certain drawing packages, uh, easy to draw on a whiteboard, but hard to really draw electronically. DFD3 makes it easy because it uses basic flowchart shapes in order to do this. So it becomes a little bit more accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also describe systems in a descriptive language such as AADL, which is an architecture description language, which you can use to talk about a system and its components and its interactions. Uh, and then lastly, we can also build the model in code. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and we're going to talk about this, you know, sort of towards the back end of the presentation, uh, where instead of building a model by drawing, so we're going to break out of this, we're going to do a diagram right away, we're going to describe the system in code and let the code build us a model. Uh, and this is a great way for for people who don't like to draw <laughs> or who are not very artistic or just don't want to, I don't know, spend the time or whatever. Um, it breaks down those barriers because now they can talk in the language they, in the language they speak, which is code and have the code generate the model for us. So effectively you get the diagram as a, an after effect of the discussion around <laughs> the architecture of the system. Yes. How many how many time how many side effects do we get in this uh, in this conversation? <laughs> as many as you can, like a I don't know a headache. <laughs> but <laughs> it's important to 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 say too that uh, before we said, hey, there's no standard language of doing this thing, but DFD DFD three appears to be making strides <laughs> into. Uh, <laughs> in that direction and uh eventually we we actually would be be glad to see it being used more uh extensively okay. it's very simple and yet it manages to be very uh uh express and and, and i i guess i'll i'll just add to that uh, one additional thing so in our travels of course we uh uh looked you know at, at various uh, modeling techniques obviously we have we have a few up here and and there's certainly more i'm sure that we've missed uh, and these are by and large extensible because you're going to potentially find things that work for you, right? Mm -hmm. So as an example, uh, I, I have a personal extension to, to DFDs uh, where DFDs, because you lose architectural information, uh, it's useful to know which endpoint in, the, in an interaction initiates a communication. So I've added a little tick mark to that to that data flow. And in DFD3, it's easy because you just take an arrow and you make it really short and you attach it to one end of a of a data flow and, and the coming outbound from from the endpoint that actually initiates communication. And it adds a lot of value for for me and for the teams I work with um, because they get to see that that ex you know they the, the, see that representation and say, oh that you know A is talking to B, not the other way around. And, and you don't always get that information from the data flow alone. Now, I should also mention that data flows in particular require other information. So yeah. the, the diagram itself has information in it, but in order to make this really work, you also have to have well, you know, annotations, descriptions about the objects um, and, those, and those, those attributes and whatnot um, sort of on the side. Right, you have to have that available in order to really interpret the the model. It's not to say it's bad; it's just it's two pieces of information that have to go together. Yeah, and actually, uh, Matt just reminded me, and this is probably going to be a good segue for the next slides. Uh, looking here at my poster of the threat modeling manifesto, one of the anti patterns that gets called in there is the perfect representation one, specifying that there is no perfect representation. Sometimes That's a good thing you use. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> sometimes different views of a uh, uh, system, different representations, different models of the same system are going to reveal different uh, kinds of information that are valuable in doing the threat elicitation. You were going to say that? I was going to say, interesting you, you called that out. If we go to the next slide. Exactly. So as Azar as, as our was saying, uh, an anti-pattern is perfect representation, meaning it's 
There is no perfect way to represent a, represent a system from a model, right? Models by design are going to be flawed, but they can bring out, you know, there's useful information you can still get out of these things as long as you don't try to be perfect. And here's a good, here are some good examples, right? So this and the next few slides you'll see all describe the same system. They all describe them in different ways, yet they're all valuable from the modeling and the, the elicitation standpoint. So here we have a system, right? And this is the DFD model, right? So this is a data flow diagram describing a system where a user talks to a server A, server A talks to server B, server B talks to a data store. And it does this over HTTPS, JDBC, and then local file access. And right off the bat, you probably are noticing a few things that would be valuable if you're going to be looking for threats because we've encoded enough information into the model that it's easy to get that point across with really nothing else, right? No, no other information. There is other information available for this model, but you don't really need it because you know that you have two processes, a data store and a user and some communication in, uh, channels. And that's great. If we go to the next slide, you'll see we have the exact same model, uh, exact same system, sorry, now using a different representation, right? So now we have DFD3 version of this. There is, again, a need to have annotations, so it describes what A, B, and C are. But you still know, and we should have actually probably should have started with this one as opposed to uh, the previous slide, because you have A and B that talk to each other, and they talk to C, which is a data store, and you have a user that talks to A. Right, And we know that there's this relationship. And just from looking at the model, you can make certain judgment calls about what the system is, what it does, and how it operates. And that's the important part about, about having a model and good representation. And, and you also have the trust boundaries in here. So yes. it's showing that A lives in a separate level of trust than B and C, which we also saw in the previous one, but represented in a different way. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and so you can make, you can eventually, you'll make judgment calls. You'll, you'll do that elicitation part to say, uh, there's a bad pattern here, right? Mm -hmm. But, but right now you can have this, you can have a conversation with your development team. As a developer, you can have a conversation with your stakeholders and say, this is what we're building. Does this make sense to you? Is this actually what we built? <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is the fun part. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. And then the, the next slide is, Yet again, another implementation or another representation of the same system. Now, this obviously is, is a sequence diagram, and we left a lot of the specific you know, details of the messages out. But really, we have, again, a user A, B, and C, and there's a flow to that data. And there's an order of operations now that we get out of this. And if you were to take this and, and, and match it to the previous slide or to two slides ago, you would then have a really good understanding of how the system actually operates. Uh, and how it's designed to work. And from that, you can then take that model and do things with it, such as finding finding threats. And that's the key part, right? So we document uh, we, we document the system. And as a side effect, well, we document the system, which may be the side effect in the first place, <laughs> but we document the system and that allows us to then do things with that to get value and meaning out of it, which includes, threats. Um, but you know this is this is important, right? So you, we we finally have a way of representing a system. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be meaningful. And just for completeness, here in the uh, the sequence uh, diagram, if uh, you all are not uh, familiar with it, you have the component of time added. That's what makes it a sequence. So time flows from the top to the bottom, meaning that that, that uh, uh, message between the user, the actor, and A happens before the one that goes from A to the user. So this way, we can also look at different uh, uh, ways that the protocol happens. When we can even analyze a full protocol and look for uh, issues that would be more difficult to figure out from a representation, for example, as a DFD, right? So, so actually, the, be, sorry, go ahead. Uh, is there no, a future, no, finish your thought? Uh, no, no, you're going where, where I think uh, I wanted to go. Well, yeah, so so before we go into the next slide, I was just going to say we, we, we haven't really talked about threat elicitation, really what it means, because we don't really want to 
focus on that. But but we do need to focus on a little bit then in that, well, how do you make threat elicitation? How do you make those decisions? And it really comes down to the information that's encoded. And there's a certain set of threats uh, that, um, that can be identified uh, that rely on this timing information, right? You can only know if you know this information, right? And so just knowing that you have process A and process B and they talk to each other isn't sufficient to find those things. But knowing you have process A and process B and they, they operate in a certain way and, and op order of operations matter, now you can start making those judgment calls about whether yeah. you actually have a particular class of threat or not. Exactly. Next slide. So here yet again, similar, <laughs> right? We have another another diagram same system modeled in a completely different way, right? So this is a network architecture diagram, right? So we have a user talking to a browser, browser goes over the internet, nice cloud that we got there, uh, goes to a load balancer, hits a front end, and then eventually makes its way to a back end server and there's data that passes between them. Now, keep in mind, this load balancer here in the middle, we, we didn't have that in those other diagrams. Right, and because we weren't looking at architecture, we were only caring about the data flowed in, in, you know, between components, and so we don't necessarily get all of the information from those models. Again, the models are not meant to be perfect; the models are meant to be representative, right? And so that's why not only can there be no perfect representation, but if you know that there can't be perfect re representation, then having multiple representations gives you better information. Uh, and it also may be that you have this diagram already because this is, I mean, this is how you build market, <laughs> marketing slides out of, or, you know, how your use cases are developed or whatever, right? And, and so you may already have this information. You, maybe you have a deployment guide and you have, and you have this, um, as opposed to a DFD, which, you know, you may not have naturally. So switching gears just a little bit. So, We've talked a little bit about how developers may be reticent to build diagrams, to build models and, and do diagramming because it's confusing or not my job, I don't have time or a various number of reasons. But one of those other reasons that developers uh, sometimes, or and not just developers, but but others, uh, stakeholders in the, process, in the security process may um, have a hard time doing the action of building a model, especially for security, is it can be scary sometimes, right? Uh, and we don't want to scare anybody except for on Halloween and DEF CON and, you know, don't want to show, show up on the wall of sheep and all that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> so we want to, we want to be careful that we don't scare people for the wrong reason, right? And we can help as security professionals, especially. So really this slide is talking to the security professional professionals out there who are, who are watching that we can help sort of smooth over and help with this activity by not using the big words, <laughs> right? So, you know, when you're talking about, I have process A and process B and the users, you know, talking over HTTP and, and they're gonna send their username and password, they're basically authenticated, right? Well. You could use that word, or you could say the web server is going to prove the identity of the of the user, or even further down, uh, you know, uh, sort of not not dumbing it down, but making it you know more understandable to the more common stakeholder. Um, you know, the 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 server is going to identify the server is going to identify the user, right? They do that through authentication, but that's okay, right? You don't necessarily need to say that. Cryptography, another big word, right? What does that mean, right? There's a lot of stuff that fits in that in that bucket. It's confusing. It's math. Some people it's don't math. like math. It's math, uh, and so you know we're going to protect data, right? By we're going to obfuscate that data. That might be a big word. We're going to change that data from form, one form to another through some mathematical process. We don't need to know what that process is. It happens to be cryptography, but you know we can we can sort of minimize the angst, right? 
Uh, and so some of these, uh, of course, we can't do that. And in fact, one of these words, as called out here, really <laughs> always is scary. Uh, and there's really no, nothing you can do about it. Um, but, uh, you know, so we can help we can help developers and other stakeholders reveal their secrets, right? What information we need to get out of this exercise. And, and when I say we, I, I sort of mean security professional. If you're, if you're moderating one of these exercises or you're leading a, a, a threat modeling exercise, uh, or if you're a stakeholder in an exercise with, uh, with the development team, especially if this is, you know, say this is an agile scrum team or, uh, or, or you're part of a, a, a project to, to do security analysis, you can help by facilitating the conversation by doing some basic translation, right? Make this accessible to stakeholders, right? So that they can be more involved in the process. And then from that, you get better information that can give you a better representation and therefore a better model. Izar, do you have any thoughts you want to add on that? No. I think <laughs> Audits the, are scary. <laughs> no, the, the only thing that I would add here probably is that uh, eventually when you talk about risk to developers, then many times the uh, the conversation goes towards, but why would someone do that? And <laughs> I find that in those cases, it's very helpful to translate risk to this is going to happen and it's bad, right? We, we can all agree that it's bad, that that's not something that should be happening, right? And that takes away the why would somebody do that? and translates it into something bad happening to the system, which usually is something that developers care more about than whomever is coming in and doing bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And this, um, actually this, uh, the notion of translation, um, you know, I've seen this myself with, uh, working with, with engineers who are, you know, brilliant people understand their systems that they're working inside and out, but don't understand the security terms. Right. And so there's a sense of, you know, potential of failure, right? Which is very a uh, bad place for a lot of people to be. And we don't want to, we don't want them to fail. It's hard to actually fail in this, right? But we don't want them to fail or think they're going to fail because this stuff is confusing or new or it's special. Uh, and, and so that's really, that's really key, right? And, and again, this just comes down to giving a, helping them understand the concept and the principles involved uh and and maybe glossing over the specific terminology unless it's important or eventually you get to okay that means it's authenticated and we put that label in there and that means a whole bunch of things and we get that one word as a placeholder um as opposed to starting with that and having people wonder okay what do you mean by that <laughs> and then you have confusion and, and actually matt I'm, I'm going to hijack for a minute the conversation sure. because i think that we forgot to talk about something very important now that we're talking about things that are scary, uh, it occurred to me, we haven't talked about basically the, the stopping problem of threat modeling. And there are two parts to it. The first one is during the modeling. How do we know that we have modeled the system enough? And that is, once you got to a point, and this is my personal, personal experience, and it works for me and uh, others will have other views on the, the issue, but I think that once you get to a representation that lets you actually make all those assumptions and inferences that, that Matt was relating to, I think that that's the good enough and we're going to address the good enough soon. But the other one is, when do I know that I have listed enough threats? And that's another thing that makes things like this scary. You wake up in the morning, in three in the morning, asking yourself, did I forget <laughs> something? And you know what, you probably did. Yes. Yeah. fine. Because this whole thing, first of all, we have to keep in mind, is evolutionary. The fact that you didn't have a threat model yesterday is bad. You have one today that's much better. And the one that you're going to have tomorrow, it's going to be much better because you're going to have learned more. So don't let that stopping problem stop you from threat modeling. Okay. The important thing is to start, do it, and then move forward with the process. That was my parenthesis. Sorry for the hijacking. That works. So how else do we get developers to reveal their secrets? Uh, so the way that I like to work with teams uh, that I found very useful is 
as somebody who's both facilitating a conversation or being asked to be the the SME, the subject matter expert on security for the project, it's very useful if we start with, you know, what is it that we do here, right? Not necessarily what do you as the engineer do on the project, but what does the system that you're building do, right? What is it? What is it meant to do? How is it meant to operate? Not necessarily from a security standpoint. Let's start basic, right? Get the conversation started with what is this thing and how does it work and what does it do and what does it operate on, right? And basically, this has a this has a systems engineering term, right? Concept of operations. If you build out the concept of operations or the conops, you get you get first off, you get a lot of information, but also you start to establish that rapport. Part of facil facilitating a threat modeling exercise and part of even just having a team come together and do the collaboration is really an exchange of ideas because it's not one person talking to another. It, it is in part in practice, but really it's a team getting together and, and discussing what they've been building and how it was designed versus implemented. Uh, and then from that, what could somebody do to, to break it horribly? Uh, and so with a concept of, op a concept of operations, uh, you get some basic information about, okay, we have this thing, it has a web server and it talks to, and a user bring, you know, uses their browser from their home and they're on this network. And then our web server talks to the database and passes information. And in that you can start doing things like building a model, <laughs> right? You get information that allows you to say, I have object A and object B and they have communications and there's a data store and there's a user that has a browser and now we have a network flow. And you get that from just having the concept of, op of operations, don't have anything else, right? But at least you have that conversation and you can ask questions, right? And then you can, now you can launch into, okay, what else, right? Which brings us to the next point. Keep on the eye, keep your eye on the prize. What are we actually trying to get out of this exercise? We're trying to get elements, interactions, and attributes. We're looking for the what, the when, and the how, right? So the what and the how really is the what do we have, what exists, how do these objects, you know, interact, how do they store data, how do they how do they communicate with other things? And then sort of the when, if we, especially if we're looking at sequence data, especially, um, you know, so how, order of operations, but you can also find out things like, okay, are there times in the, in the system's life cycle when we maybe don't have the database protected, right? Or maybe the network is wide open during setup or, oh, that key that you wanted to protect. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the clear until we encrypt it at some point later. Right. And so we really get the what, the how, and the when based on what the system is. And then we can start asking the questions. Okay. Oh, so you have this database. Okay. How do you talk to the database? Oh, okay. Do you use, uh, do you, use, do you, do you, do you prove that the server is the server talking to the database? AKA do you authenticate the data, the, the web server? Oh yeah. We do that with a password that we store on disk. Oh, how do we store that? Oh, it's in the clear until the first pass and then it gets encrypted. Okay. So now we can, we can move on to do some thread elicitation from that. We can build out some attack trees about how an attacker might want to influence the system to steal that key, for instance. And so that's really the, the conversation starter and into the exercise. And you see, that's why you are a much better modeler than, than I am, because I just try to have these meetings like at lunchtime, I bring pizza and I say, nobody gets pizza until I get all the secrets. <laughs> It probably so, works better than, than, than how I approach it, but. Uh, no, I think you to get better results than I do. I, well, it, it, and actually it, it is funny, uh, you know, that you can take different approaches. Some people do the good cop, bad cop arrangement. Um, I try to do both. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard when you're the good cop and the bad cop at the same time, um, unless you're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, and, uh, you know, or or you're, you know, friends with the developers, right? Uh, meaning you get friendly, you get be part of the team. I like to get integrated with the team when I talk, when I talk to them, right. And really be a part of the, the part of the group, not because I want them to like me, <laughs> but that helps. Um, but, but because I want them to know that I'm there as a trusted partner, right. I'm there to facilitate. I'm there to provide my expertise to them if they don't have it or to provide another pair of eyes if they do. Right, and that's important. And you actually just reminded me of a conversation that I had with uh, Brooke Schoenfeld, who's another 
amazing threat, uh, threat modeling expert. And we were discussing uh, talking to, to teams and especially that barrier between being the guy coming to help do the threat model, not a guy coming to threat model, the guy coming to help do the threat model. There's a big distinction in there. And how sometimes, even when you're modeling, you, you, you hit that barrier where the team feels that you are basically criticizing their design. So it's important to let them know that, no, you, you, you're not there to tell them you wrote the thing badly. You're there to help them make whatever it is that they built, whatever it is that they're building, more robust, more secure. Okay? So when you're having this dialogue with the team, it's really important for them to understand that you are on their side. You're not the big bad auditor or whatever, the, the big security guy that came to say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, fix that. You're the guy that's working with them to make the thing that they are already doing better. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. All right. So some other tips here. Um, first one is when you're thinking about a system, in order to help facilitate a model, it's helpful to think about this in terms of subject action target attributes. Now, let me explain that a little bit more. When you build out a model, a diagram especially, you're going to put, say, you're going to put object A and object B on the, on the diagram, and you're going to connect them with a line. Well, connect them with a line establishes a subject and a target and some action. And there's attributes that go along with those objects and that interaction, such as Right, whether it's authenticated or not, for instance. So, so let's say we have process A, something A, and something B, and they communicate. So A communicates with B. Now, saying A communicates with B means A initiates communication, meaning sends a message or requests information from B. We can also say, as the other example here, we have a process that listens on port 8080, and it will take a username and password from user, aka I have a process. It opens a network communication port and waits for a connection on port 80. So I, I would have a line coming inbound to this process. And I would have, have attributes that says it's over port 8080 and it's authenticated. Now, of course, it's port 8080, so it's in the clear. Who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> minor minor problem, right? But that's okay, right? And so so really the language that you use to describe the system when you're communicating to to stakeholders or as stakeholders are communicating amongst themselves, you can build the model from that language because you're basically describing the system as you're talking, right? And that's important. It's important because you're not doing that translation of, okay, well, blah, 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 blah. We have, we have this, this object and we have this object and it makes a function call to this API and this API then transmits TCP data over, an, over a network, blah. Okay, great. But we don't actually need all of that to make the, the determination of, I have port 8080 HTTP and I'm passing a username and password over it, <laughs> right? And so, that's that's important uh, as as the tip here is is if you keep in mind that okay what talks to what and how does it talk to that and then what are the attributes on that now you get the language that allows you to build a model easier. Lastly, uh, or, or at least you know for for this slide, we want to remind developers that they already have a lot of information. We, we've already talked about this, uh, and we'll just ha hammer this point home, right? That there's a probably already a body of information available that you can use to, to either jumpstart the conversation or to bootstrap the modeling ac uh, exercise uh, so that you get, you know, you can pull good information out, right? You may have drawings, block diagrams, especially architecture diagrams, etc. You may have specifications for the system or requirements or use cases, right? And you can use that information to then, uh, you know, do the right thing when it comes to building out a representation and then doing thread elicitation. So it's recommended, or uh, we'll make a recommendation, to use what you have already. Use the body of information that you already have available to start the conversation, right? That way you, certainly if you're a stakeholder, if you're a security expert coming in from the outside, you get that connection to the team. You can, they can feel like you're, you're invested, you've invested time to look at what they've already been doing and, and 
there's a trust that can be established there. Um, and then don't be a, get afraid to give out homework, right? Uh, to to stakeholders, right? If there's a if there's a problem that you hit during the modeling exercise, like go, oh, we have this process. We don't not sure how it does what it does. Like we know it talks to these things, but we don't really know how that happens. Okay, fine. Break for the break for the evening and tell you know, <laughs> hey, can you uh, Joe or Jim and go off and research that. Come back to us at the next meeting, right? It's okay to give out homework, right? The, the information is there somewhere. If it's not in diagrams or in specifications, it's potentially in code, right? And somebody has to just go figure it out. Uh, is there a next slide? Thank you. So we talked a little bit about good enough is good enough. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> so let's set clear expectations about what we mean by what do we need versus what we want, right? We can never have it be perfect because representations uh, of the real thing are never going to be exact because if we have exactly the real thing then we're not building a representation we're, we're building the real thing uh, and so we just need to decide how much information is going to be sufficient and then figure out okay are we there yet can we stop and say it's good enough right so because there are no perfect representations there's different ways that we can express data and that data can then allow us to do to make judgment calls about what's what what security concerns there might be especially or what privacy or other concerns there might be um we just as, as a stakeholder or as a team you need to decide are we are we there yet right or have we met that good enough state and it's okay to say we're good enough with having one of those diagrams we had previously if that's if that's a system maybe that's good enough right so it's up to you and it's really up to the stakeholders to know what's meaningful and valuable to them All right, so a couple things about barriers and how do we remove those barriers. So keep in mind that we have uh, in this new work from anywhere or uh, you know post well or post or current uh, pandemic uh, environment with people working remotely, working from home. Uh, you need a way of building a model collaboratively, right? And so there are a number of ways you could do this. Uh, and, and we'll talk about we'll talk about a couple of ways a little later. So I don't want to step on Israel's toes, uh, but you know, keep in mind that when you you have ways of building collaboratively, right? So you can do like a Zoom call, right? And on a virtual whiteboard, uh, you know, if somebody sets up a webcam, looking at their at their wall with a with a whiteboard on it, and you can draw. It's hard sometimes because sometimes you don't don't get good camera resolution, or you might have delays in the video, etc. Um, but that's one way of, of building a model collaboratively, but you can also build it by a good selection of tools. One of the things we talk about in the uh, Threat Modeling Manifesto is choosing tools that are useful and not making them the center of your world, but using them to facilitate the conversation, right? Facilitate the construction of that documentation and nothing else. Uh, so that's important. Now, once you have chosen the right method of doing a collaborative model, we want to make sure that we maintain that, right? So as the system changes, we want to keep the diagram up to date, keep the model up to date more importantly, because the diagram and its annotations, um, to keep that up to date so that as the system changes, we can keep track of things and, and threats will come and go, right? So say you change that interface uh, on that process from, HTTP, from you know, HTTP port 8080 to 8443, well, now I've closed out a set of threats. I may have introduced new ones, Right, and so it's important to keep the diagram up to date as and the model up to date as changes occur, so that the threat elicitation can follow. And then, lastly, uh, at least for for me here, the the common patterns in diagrams exist. So as you're looking through a system and as you're describing the system, you'll notice that patterns appear. Right, so you have I have a web server over over a, a HTTP. Well, that means that's a pretty common pattern, actually. I mean, you could first off, you could build a toolkit of of objects that you could plug in, like if you had a stencil kit, right? You could create those, um, but also just interpreting a diagram, you may then match that to a pattern in your threat modeling process. And and Isar can certainly talk more about something like uh, continuous threat modeling, which looks at these patterns and, and allows you to do that threat elicitation 
easier because you have a common pattern that appears throughout your models. And I'll turn over to you, Azar, for some other thoughts there and the, these other ideas. So uh, very, very quickly and very hand wavy. There is a bunch of other ideas on how to overcome this, this, uh, this, di this uh, uh, obstacles. So for example, you could say, hey, you know what? You guys don't want to draw, to, to draw, don't draw. Let's get somebody who is ready to draw, put them in the head of the other class. And as people talk, he's going to draw on a whiteboard. Then we take a picture of the whiteboard and we distribute to everybody. Yay, we have a model. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. The important thing is you have a model. The problem is you don't have a model that you can easily update, keep a version, put together with your code, distribute, annotate. But you know what? You have a model. That's already a good thing. Another thing is infer diagrams. You have enough stuff. You should have enough stuff lying around to give you enough to start with some kind of diagram. And who knows? Perhaps people see what you did and they start saying, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And you end up with one that's actually right. But you could start from requirements. You could start from use cases. You could start from post-its that people left around saying, hey, this is how I wrote this thing. You could even look, if there is, at code and come up with something that the team can look at and say, yeah, you know what? It's a good start. Let's, let's finish it well. Then you have, especially to address the collabor collaboratively uh, a part of the thing, diagrams a service. We have nowadays enough uh, things like Lucid Charts and Draw.io and I don't know the next one and uh, the other one that people can actually collaborate over with their mouse in their browsers, everybody together, doesn't matter if it's a Mac, Linux, or PC, or anything. People are just working on the same canvas and trying at the same time to model that system. So that's, that's a good one. Uh, and then we close with model as code. And model as code, for us, is very close and dear to our hearts because it's part of something called threat modeling as code or threat modeling from code which uh, Matt has already alluded. And now we are sort of going to show you. Now, I have very fat fingers. I, uh, I am terrible when I do um, live demos. So instead, I'm going to show you the whole thing and point you in the right direction so that you can try by yourself. So we are talking about something called PyTM. PyTM started about uh, two, three years ago. Well, and uh, Matt, and I started it with, uh, 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 with the help of uh, some great people, Jan Vaz, uh, uh, Nick, one of the organizers of the, uh, the, the village, and uh, Rohit Shambhuni as well. And what we thought in there was, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we have a simple way to express a system and once we did that, we would get diagrams and we would get threats out of it. A different way of uh, uh, threat modeling for developers, by developers. And that escapes a bit from the tried and true method of I'll give you a GUI, you drag some shapes, you connect them, and you're going to set attributes, and then you're going to get a report. Uh, Surprisingly enough, some people don't really like that flow. And as we, we alluded to, they prefer to express their systems in a way that they already know, that they're already familiar with, and that we could even say is a bit less threatening for them. So what is PyTM? It's a library written in Python that lets you define the components of the model and the relationships, which now we know are the data flows. It knows how to generate a DFD or a sequence diagram. Uh, it lets you annotate the components with their attributes. And it uses those attributes and the data flows to elicit threats that derive from uh, OWASP top 10, from uh, the top 25 uh, list, from KPAC, uh, and give you those threats as a function of the components and the data flow attributes. Now, what does it look like? And actually, so, before you jump yeah. into the what does it look like, just to remind folks, it is uh, open source, yep. uh, and it's up on GitHub. You can find it, and I think we have a link for it later. But... We, do. we do. So this is the minimal scaffolding that you need 
to write a PyTM uh, model description. Uh, everybody recognizes by now the invocation to Python 3. We are not Python 2 compatible. And we basically start by importing some uh, classes that represent elements, like the whole threat model itself, TM, an actor, a trust boundary, uh, classification for data. You can say if data is top secret, re restricted, public. Uh, an object for data itself. We treat data as an element, which is not something that you see a lot <clears throat> nowhere else. Uh, then you have a data flow to uh, carry that data between elements. You have a data store to store that data. And then you have a process and a higher class uh, uh, element, which is a server. We start by defining the threat model object itself. It's going to hold everything together. And where you see there in red, your model goes here. That's the place where you actually add your description of your model. And then you call tm.process, which will take all the description that you just wrote, plus the arguments that you supplied in a command line, and come out with the output that you uh, required. Now, what goes into that your model goes here? We start simple with what would be in a DVD, the blobs. So those are the elements that we have in this case. We have a user, we have a client, we have a server, we have a database. Things are kept very simple in here. We say what they are and we give them names. Then we start with the data flows, the relationships between those elements that we just uh, uh, described. So in here, actually, uh, these slides are a bit uh, dated. And where you see data flow from where to where, and then the third field, here it is a name for the data flow, a description for the data flow. Actually, now we require data flow objects in there. So the data flow, it's, uh, sorry, data objects in there. So the data flow actually is enriched by the attributes of the data that it carries. And we can see here, uh, an interaction between the user and the client, uh, data that comes in from the client to the server, data that gets saved from the server to the database, and so on and so forth. With just that in place, we are able to generate these two uh, diagrams. The top one is a DFD. And again, the slide is a bit dated. We have ported uh, PyTM to support DFD3. So now we are uh, moving on with the times and supporting that effort. And the bottom one is a sequence uh, diagram. And now that we see them both side to side, we can reinforce what Matt had said, that they actually describe the same system, describe the same relationships, but in different ways that let you see uh, different aspects of the system and perhaps infer different threats, right? But then we go further. We now define trust boundaries. Remember when we spoke about it in the, in the beginning with the, the sample uh, diagrams, we are defining levels of trust in between the elements and how the data flows cross those levels of trust. So we declare a public boundary and a protected boundary. And then we start putting elements inside the respective boundaries where they sit. Once we again run the script, we get our DFD with full representation of the trust boundaries. So we can infer even more security uh, uh, information out of it. In the end, we have a very simple template language that lets you express what can clearly be seen as a full threat model uh, report. So we have the diagram. We enrich it with information about the data flows, things that if we put it in the diagram, even though it's possible, if we put it in there, it would make it very uh, difficult to read and to follow the diagram. So we uh, decided to put it on a separate table. And basically, you get the same information, but enriched with the data. Then we have a data dictionary. We want to know what are the units of data that this system works on. It gives us a better understanding of how things flow from one part to another and how they are transformed. 
And then we close with a list of the potential threats that uh, have been found in this with this representation. And and sorry, before you before you close that out, is our it's important to note, you know, we basically have 20, 25 lines of code mm -hmm. which generate a model with significant significant sufficient amount of information and the annotations that go with it to then do thread elicitation. Right? And and that's important. And so the model then we can also keep up to date as the system changes. It can exactly. be collaborative because we can put that model into, say, you know, a source code repository tool and you can do code reviews on it uh, or do, you know, pull requests. And now we've met all of those goals, right? Uh, and it's a pretty straightforward method. Now, obviously, we're biased because, <laughs> you know, this is this is our you know, tool that we've worked on for a while now. Um, but this is this demonstrates of a way of this that you can do this, and and certainly there are other tools out there, right? We encourage you to find the tool that works for you. Um, but this does address that challenge of having an easy way of describing a system that you can pull from existing material, that you can do collaboratively, and you don't have to be a fan. You don't have to be an artist to do it. <laughs> And uh, we have had cases where people have collaborated long, vast distances by, uh, as, as Matt said, sub, uh, submitting PRs real, real time, or just committing to the same, uh, to the same branch. And it's just a matter of each one writes their part of the description. You run the thing, you get the, the diagram right away. Now, uh, one important thing, PyTM follows the philosophy of Unix tools. It tries to do well what it's supposed to do and nothing beyond that. So we use things like plant UML, we use uh, graph viz and uh, for the, the, the creation of the report, we create it in a textual manner that you can use something like uh, Sphinx, Sphinx? Uh, sure. to Pan, or Pandoc. And Pandoc to translate between different formats. Yep. So uh, it, it's a very uh, low, low weight, low barrier of en entry. And even though it's written in Python, and even though it uh, it asks for a Python script, you can see from the, the syntax that anybody that has any kind of experience with uh, an object-oriented language is able to, to describe that system. So you can go to a JavaScript uh, developer, you can go to a C++ developer, and they'll be able to write in, jump, and describe their systems. There's, no, uh, there's a very low barrier of entry to be able to describe your, your system. Uh, I guess that that's what we had, and we are over time, actually. Yep. So, so next slide. Yeah. Thank you very much for for attending this presentation. Hopefully, you'll have a chance to ask some questions when it's live. <laughs> and you have some references here. The first one is the Threat Modeling Manifesto, which we heartily uh, recommend as a, even a starting point to to threat modeling. Then you have the Ugly Fish book. You have the pointer to. Uh, uh, PyTM, which actually is an incubator project on uh, OWASP. And uh, the next four are basically uh, threat modeling information, but uh, to a deeper level. The continuous threat modeling that Matt alluded to is something that uh, uh, we, we developed some time ago and Autodesk open sourced as a way to do threat modeling by developers with developers for developers. And uh, the next two books are books that we personally really like. Adam Shostak's Threat Modeling, Designing for Security, which is already a classic on uh, threat modeling and talks about basically everything. And uh, uh, Brooke Shafford's Securing Systems, where he gives great examples of architectures and threats to those architectures, how to mitigate them. And he simply draws from his very, very, very vast experience. And for those that need uh, a bit more uh, accessible reading, there is the Safe Code Technical Threat Modeling, which looks at facets of threat modeling just to build that common language and let people start and uh, uh, take something away from it. So I guess that now we move to questions and uh, now we go live. So see you there.